Today we're going to be talking about big boy ships and space engineers and how fundamentally they're just utterly flawed and generally quite shit. Yes, I've already sworn in the first 10 seconds, demonetized. There's a tendency for people in the space engineers community to build these supersized ships. Now let's note real quick, I'm not talking about large ships, so capital ships, battleships, you name it, uh, so cruisers or battleships rather. I'm talking about these like navy defining super ships, right? Let's use Halo as an example because I know everyone loves Halo. The Covenant have the super carrier, right? The CSG or whatever it's called. That is not a super ship. Even though it is far larger than any other ship, they're capable of producing this and on their scale, it's a standard ship, right? I mean, one of their main capital ships, but it's a standard ship for them. But on the flip side, something like the Infinity is considered a, you know, super size ship, right? Because it's a one of, technically it was attempted to be a two of, but it's a navy defining ship. That is a big boy ship or a dreadnought as many people like to call them. People and space engineers love building these style ships because it's a degree of fantasy fulfillment. It is the single baddest ship in every battle that it shows up into. It's got every weapon for every contingency. No one can take it on even 1v5, so on and so forth. But fundamentally, I'm gonna be talking today about not only in space engineers, but as just a theory in general of how ships like this make no sense whatsoever. And this trend to build these ships of bigger, more better doesn't really work in space engineers and as a whole. Remember that distinction though earlier where I talked about it's relative to the Navy that's building them, right? The Covenant could afford them, right? Because they built a lot of them, but Earth couldn't. So it'll make more sense when I get into it. Something interesting before proceeding, I'm going to be using this ship called the EFN Eternity's Advent a lot as an example. This is a essentially a super battleship by relative standards in my universe because it's roughly 25,000 blocks, has a fully, fully fledged interior, very respectable weapons, uh, no weapon spam, but it's still a lot of weapons. In our RP slash server scenario, she has about five to 10 times more weapons than any other ship in the server. She's honking huge, and even against hostile battleships, she generally has about double the firepower in terms of point allocation, right? We operate on a point system to prevent spam. She's also a modern ship in a non-modern system. She's entering a older system. So think perhaps British Navy versus the Argentinian one, right, in the Falklands. Not so far in uh, apart in tech that, like, victory is impossible and alien, but there is a noticeable gap in terms of capability brought. So I'll be talking to, about her as a lot in an example because I've done a lot of PvP at the helm of that ship against a lot of other smaller ships and in a strategic, tactical, and operational manner, right? Different scalings. And it kind of speaks to this example I'm going to be using, right? Everyone loves examples, right? A lot of her size comes down to her, your, her utility and role-playing nature. She houses something like 13 people, which is a lot for space engineers. Uh, all of which are required to do battle, to run her, to use her facilities, etc. She also has a ludicrously large hangar that um, makes her all but a name essentially a carrier. Multiple production facilities, massive cargo, the list goes on. She has it all, right? This is what a lot of people think of when they're creating their super ship. She ticks all those boxes. She is a, sh a shark in a sea of small fish, or is it a pond of small fish? I don't know how the saying goes. <laughs> But like I said, she has fought in countless battle battles, just short of 10, which is a fair bit, sunk way, sunk, voided, uh, countless ships, uh, feared by many, yada, yada, yada. When people build super ships and when they're talking about it on my Discord or Reddit or whatever, they think the Eternity is a good example of a super ship, right? Now, people make them bigger, but uh, we stuck to 25,000 blocks because space engineers can't handle much more than that without just bricking when you add other ships in. But I'm going to turn around after that whole thing and say the Eternity for space engineers and as a concept as a whole is immensely overbuilt, insanely impractical, and terrible for your military outside of propaganda purposes. Reason number one, opportunity cost. In our universe, but you can extrapolate this to your universe, uh, survival, or just a real-life fictional military, 
it costs for us something like 25 turns to build a ship like this. A cruiser costs six turns, a light battleship costs 14 turns, and a destroyer costs one turn. That means you can have roughly five cruisers for 25,000 uh, 5, blocks each, so 25,000 blocks, but it's spread out over five ships. You can have almost two battleships for a displacement of roughly 30,000 blocks spread out over two ships, or you can have 25 destroyers totaling 87,000 blocks uh, per destroyer. Right? And then obviously you can mix and match in between that and have a far more flexible force. Even if you get rid of our rule system and go straight to survival, the battleship is ludicrously costed because she is so complex, right? Being that big, she needs systems. She has a much higher density of vital components and redundancy for said vital components, right? Because of her weight, she needs exponentially more thrusters than smaller ships, right? So a lot of her systems is dedicating to having these huge thruster banks. Her design is also kind of awkward to build in survival, massively complex, uh, layered armor, subsections, redundant structures, redundant bridges, you know, CICs, all that. She needs all of this stuff and stuff that might be too expensive for smaller ships, right? No expense spared on this one because you have to go all out because she is so much more expensive, right? You don't want to half-ass it because, well, this represents a huge percentage of your, you know, Navy's budget, right? I'll get more into that in a bit. Finally, and most importantly, from a space engineer's point of view, she needs a massive crew to function properly. Typically speaking, we run her with a minimum crew of a captain to manage maneuvering her, an XO to relay sub orders, right? Uh, the crew is large enough that you kind of need two people. At minimum, two gunners, three is nice, a pilot, so a helmsman, a minimum of two engineer personnel to manage the system, and then preferably more on top of that to manage in-field repairs, deployment of her, uh, her fighters, so on and so forth. We can downscale her, but her size is such that she quickly becomes useless and just acts as a giant brick that kind of trundles around when you have a minimal crew size. Meanwhile, you have destroyers that can basically be solo piloted and some cruisers that can use two people crews without a sweat, right? In practice, in space engineers, when you have a ship that takes up five, maybe 10 people to manage, and realistically, you probably only have 10 people total, it becomes quickly a logistical nightmare to properly staff something like this. And you'd be better served by just having people in smaller ships. But... The counter argument is this ship is so powerful, so effective that the, the trade-offs, right, the cost, the crew requirements, the lack of flexibility is worth it because you win every battle. Well, do you? Let's get into the tactical performance of a supersized ship. So I'm going to tell you, practically speaking, in battle, these supersized ships kind of suck. Straight up. right? Because the expectation is being, let's say, you know, closing in on 10 times bigger than a destroyer, you would expect at minimum 10 destroyers required to kill this type of ship. I'm telling you, it doesn't work like that. The scaling is actually inversed, right? For the Eternity and other supersized ship, every block on the Eternity is worth far less than a block on a destroyer. So much so that you could probably end up killing a 30,000 block ship with maybe 10,000 blocks worth of destroyers or 15,000 blocks worth of destroyers, cruisers, and maybe battleships. Why? Well, the big thing is tactical tempo. The larger number of ships can dictate how the battle goes. While the larger ship will win every single 1v1, this isn't a 1v1 battle. In our practice of battle engagements, the only way we could win was to strike so rapidly and so fast that the enemy numbers could not coalesce into a meaningful manner. This means striking before they've formed up a formation, and you can kind of isolate the ships and just do a bunch of 1v1s after another. So 1v1, move on to the next 1v1, move on to the next 1v1. As soon as the battle turns into a 1v4, 1v5, whatever, the battle rapidly degrades, the Eternity weapon systems get overwhelmed, right? Lots of dispersed fire, non-concentrated fire, and her effectiveness goes down the gutter. This is mainly due to the fact that, A, while she has the largest concentration of weapons on herself, 
four ships actually have somewhat parity when you consider effective guns on target. You combine with the fact that these super ships are never fast unless you have some ludicrously mo like insane mods installed. They are slow and they are big. And in Space Engineers, hit factor is a very big deal. That is, your ability to make hits, your hit percentage per round and per time spent. Because she is so big, the effective fire of any ships, including destroyers with fairly inaccurate weapons, goes through the roof. I, I don't have a perfect number on it, but it's not hard to hit ships like this. So because she lacks the ability to defend in the most effective way possible for space engineers, well, she's going to take a lot of hits. And she's going to have to rely on her armor, which is always less effective than just dodging the rounds in the first place. And no matter how armored you are, taking hits degrades your combat effectiveness. She's basically a giant billboard. The logic is, well, she'll, she's so damn thick that she makes up for it with her weapons. Yeah, absolutely. However, due to her nature of being a one-of ship, she ends up being having to be a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. She needs PDC, anti-small grids, anti-destroyer weapons or ep weaponries, and obviously a respectable main battery. However, she needs all of these, right? Including axial weapons and uh, more. However, when you look at the small ships, they don't need to do this. How often have you seen a destroyer that has capital grade weapons, anti-air, anti-torpedo, whatever, uh, anti what's, what's an anti-torpedo, anti has torpedoes, so on and so forth? You don't. You see specialized ships because the expectation is they're going to work with a larger group and specialization is far more effective. So suddenly, a battleship, which on paper shouldn't show parity to the Eternity, if they just go all in on capital grade weapons, huh, suddenly that gap closes rapidly. Now you could say, well, your super ship could go all in on one weapon type, but that doesn't work. Because the ship is so expensive, she's not allowed to not be flexible. Let's pretend all every you know faction has like a hundred points to spend, right? Because we're talking about efficient usage of points. If you have five thousand points and everyone else has a hundred points, this conversation doesn't matter. But in a world where everyone has a hundred points, well, the Eternity or other super ships like it would represent something like seventy to ninety percent of your point budget. She has to be flexible because if she's not flexible, your navy can't perform certain mission types because your navy is that ship. This makes her inefficient in a lot of regards. While a different navy has, you know, battleships or cruisers that represent 10%, 5% of the navy. And you can specialize and you can have specialized squadrons. Because if that squadron can't handle it, well, you send a different squadron in or you slot ships in and out. This moves on to another issue, operational flexibility. When you have a ship like this, you go from what should be the case, strategy, um, is dictated what, by what is needed to strategy is dictated by what you have. The strategy for the, na for the nation or the, the navy with a ship like this is the ship itself. And that's not good. Because once again, going back to that 100 point analogy, because your navy is this big ship, you can't do anything outside of the ship. Right? And even if you scale it back to, well, maybe the ship is only 50%, of your navy, it still represents a huge percentage of your uh, available flexibility. And when then when you consider the fact that this ship is a priority target for the enemy, a lot of that other points are going to be dedicated to supporting that super ship. Going back a little bit, even, even when you scale it back to something like 20% of your navy is represented in a sim similar ship, you, be, you still have operational inflexibility issues. So, for example, in Season 1, we had a faction called the Riders. They had the largest concentration of capital ships, but a low amount of destroyers. They decided to move all of their capital ships into one sector and mostly into one squadron. This was really good because it was the strongest squadron by a large margin in the universe. However, this gutted their operational flexibility or even their strategic flexibility. Because of the ability of the opposite faction to basically just bog down this concentration of ships, never needed to win, and they never actually really did win truly. Um, they just needed to kind of keep it occupied. And when they did that, they had a lot less ships occupy a lot more ships in terms of budgeting, 
such that the Ryder military was basically tactically frozen, or strategically frozen, rather. Because their, their force concentration was basically nullified, they had no other ships anywhere else to do anything. And their strategy was basically, this squadron needs to win, and everything else is predicated off of that. And that is really bad, because the enemy is just going to bog that down and try to make gains elsewhere which is what the enemy faction ended up doing. They bogged them down, suppressed the riders' expansion, and just built capital ships of their own off of their stronger industrial base. Strategically, the situation gets even worse, and I've already touched upon it. Since this asset is so large, it's beginning to be considered a strategic asset, you lose the benefits of being able to use it aggressively, right? You can't use it flexibly because it's all of it is concentrated, right? You can't split apart your ship, but you also can't really use it aggressively uh, anymore. Why? Because the enemy goes from needing to win this battle, to go here, to do this, to do that, to we just need to kill this ship because killing that ship represents such a strategic win because it's a strategic asset, right? It, the, one side's military is entirely based on it that you have to be insanely careful with how you use it, right? Everyone's going to make a fuck up or make a bad call. That is, there's no question about it. It will happen at some point. But the thing is, if you have a dispersed Navy with, uh, you know, 5% total power representation on a cruiser or even 10% versus 60 to 70%, you can make mistakes because making a mistake only represents 10% of your power at most being thrown down the gutter. However, if you make a bad call with a super capital ship, a Dreadnought, you're representing close to, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever it ends up being, percent of your power down the drain in an instance, which is enough to lose wars, right? So because you're going to make a bad call at some point, you have to be insanely sure beyond a reasonable doubt when you use your ship, you're not going to lose it. Thus, you have a lot of inflexibility in this regard you have to play very conservatively meanwhile the enemy knows this too and is doing everything in your power in its power to make you make it unforced error or a forced error so to speak the yamato is kind of an example of this it's more nuanced but i'm going to keep it simple this was one hell of a super ship in theory right but due to the nature of how the war played out it quickly became a too big to fail type vessel and we rarely ever saw it being committed to a fight that especially early on in the war where the outcome of the war was questionable, we never really saw it committed to a fight because the fear of losing it outweighed the benefits of deploying it, right? It was always this thing in the back pocket as a strategic asset that America had to be worried about. Uh, but flip side, Japan also had to be worried about losing her, right? It's more complicated than that, carriers, yada, yada, yada. But in practice, the War of the Pacific was largely carrier-based. And then for the actual fighting ships, it was basically just cruisers and destroyers doing the majority of the legwork. Not necessarily because battleships didn't exist in theater. They absolutely did, and some did play a part. But just because of the flexibility of using cruisers and destroyers in a war where you could expect to lose any of these. So in closing, super ships are cool. They're really cool. But they don't make sense on a variety of levels. They're just too expensive and they quickly enter a phase of too big to fail, right? With a smaller like battleship or something, you can go aggressively and be like, hey, I'm willing to sacrifice this battleship for a, a local win. And you can either choose to get wrecked by this battleship and maybe destroy it, but we, I win the battle. With a super ship, it's always, I cannot lose this ship because if I lose the ship, I lose the war, right? And you have no flexibility, right? We went through the, the kind of listing of it. If this ship represents a sizable percentage of your military, you're screwed on every level. Tactically, right? Smaller vessels can pin you down and just kind of push you into a corner because you don't really have the ability to fight back. Space engineers specifically, these ships are easily overwhelmed. Uh, even though they have more firepower in the aggregate, the ability of that firepower to be effectively brought upon a swarmed, or not even a swarm, right? A standard against the standard squadron is questionable at best, right? We saw countless examples in real life where large vessels with a superior firepower advantage was basically overwhelmed by a larger force with less firepower, right? 
And that's not even speaking to the fact of, realistically speaking, those ships will probably have the same class of weapons of you, just slightly less of them. You move to the operational level where you think maybe these things are better because you can win every battle, quote unquote. But the issue is these vessels are so cumbersome in their deployment, right, that everything revolves around them, that once again, uh, it, it ends up creating a strategy that is the ship instead of making a strategy that makes sense. And then finally, like the strategic level, it's basically more of the same. Uh, the, end, the, the, the war becomes around protecting and keeping the ship alive, and you end up in a situation where you can only deploy it in certain scenarios. And for the enemy, killing the ship is a victory. But for you, winning a battle might not even be that useful because you can't use it in an offensive manner, right? Because just winning a battle isn't always important. You have to win things. Okay, taking a step back before I sign off. The Eternity, the ship I used as an example, was always meant to function in a larger fleet, and she was designed as such. But for the scenario, we kind of transplanted her into this new scenario for interest, fun, so on and so forth, right? Battlestar Galactica is interesting because we kind of have a ship that was meant to function as a larger element, basically doing things it wasn't really meant to do. And thus, you get an interesting show, and that's what's going on here. So, hopefully this was interesting. Um, it might have been a little too esoteric in a lot of ways, and I could have gone a lot more into the specifics of why large ships don't work in space engineers. But the reality is a lot of what we do is role play, right? I, I don't know anyone who has designed a ship and then not come up with a backstory for said ship, right? So I'm kind of talking about that here too, right? So when you build your super ship, well, these reasons don't really make as much sense as you might think they might make a sense. Uh, anyway. Hopefully that was interesting. This wasn't really meant to be put a foot down and be like, hey, don't build your super ships. This was more just a discussion on the downsides of these super, you know, dreadnought mega ships. Okay. Anyway, thanks for watching. Um, if you want to check out the series, I have a pinned video on my channel that explains what the series is in more detail. Regardless, see ya.